Good morning, devs. Yesterday was my last day interning at Amazon. We officially secured the return offer. And I don't know if you could tell, but I've been working like 12 hours a week for the last few weeks. Like, look at my hair. I haven't gotten a haircut in months. I'm in an absolute shambles. But the best part is that means we can now work on our app Empor again. Since we released the app three months ago, 100,000 of you have watched my video explaining how I built out the app in 93 days. Since then, on the app itself, we've hit 1137 McGill users, got around $4,100 in sales, and won $2,500 in funding for the top prize for sustainability at McGill. So needless to say, our beta was a success. We're now about to launch on a larger scale, maybe expanding to another university. Let's see what happens. And the craziest part is like 80% of the code is generated with AI. So in this vlog, I'm going to take you through a week of my life developing the app and showing you how I leverage all these AI tools to build stuff for me. We got a crazy week. Let's just jump straight into it. So first of all, we're pivoting the app. And I've been going back and forth with my founders. This is all just one text I sent explaining the pivot. And we've come to this idea. Basically, the marketplace aspect alone is super solid, but we want to gain further traction. So first, we're putting more of an emphasis on our current community model. Right now, in the beta, it was okay. It was a bit successful. People would post images of themselves. But honestly, it was a bit underwhelming. And that's because there wasn't any direction. And we kind of rushed out that feature. So one thing we're considering is pivoting to make an anonymous community chat. It's kind of important proven to be the stickiest, most viral retention loop for university students. Like think of apps like Yik Yak, SideChat, all based off of this and get like millions of dollars in funding. So basically in Empor, we're going to create a simple promise where you can post freely if you want anonymously. And there are going to be a bunch of different threads tailored for university students, like confession threads, course discussions, or even places where you could make buy requests, which was an incredibly in-demand feature. You could then also have a place to sell tickets. You because when we surveyed like 500 students, 93% of them said tickets was the biggest thing they wanted added to that. We could then also find roommates. Really, the opportunity is endless. And the ability to toggle on, off anonymity is just a pretty cool feature that I think will drive users onto the platform when a marketplace on its own wouldn't have gained that kind of track. Craziest part is it's currently August 2nd. The school year starts in 23 days. So that's all the time we have. Let's see if we can get done this week. All right, so first of all, for development, I've tried a bunch of different LLMs and AI tools. And by far, my favorite is Herser. And that's because when you ask an LLM to make changes for you, you get these like inline fixes. So you could go and see exactly what it's doing, reject or accept certain decisions. So that way you're still in control of what gets produced. Even at Amazon, I would use Cursor and I feel like it would help me work at least three times faster. In particular, I would use Claude 4.0's model because I feel like without a doubt, it's just the best model for programming. All right, so as we started scaling to more and more users, I noticed that some of my Spring boot backend has potential memory leak issues which caused the server to crash period is obviously not good and it's because we weren't releasing connections properly and this is something that i didn't even know was an issue because i've never built an app to scale on my own like this so while i worked through these issues i thought i'd show you how i've leveraged claude in cursor to help me identify all these problems so here i opened the cursor mini window and gave it the error message i would get when my server would crash on heroku and then it goes through and identified potential in memory issues i was using like this completely stupid m plus one query I was doing and then it recommended fixes for me. So then I asked it to just go ahead and implement these fixes. So you can see it's like generating some changes in the repository, which I would go through and review on my own. And I will say when you're in a production environment, it's really dangerous to completely just trust this. So you cannot do that. But it's a great starting point because it helped me identify possible issues. So I could go into other LLMs like OpenAI and kind of teach myself like when should you use database level filtering, for example, what are the pros and cons of everything. So I'm just going to spend the next like four hours here working through some of these memory issues. All right, we're done. Everything seems to load much faster on the app now. So hopefully that resolves that issue where the server will crash. I kind of just have to monitor it for the next little bit. That does remind me, I think it's critical if you're really working with AI so much to implement heavy security features. So for example, for our backend, we use JWT tokens for authentication purposes. So the only way you could ever make a request is if you have a valid account on our platform. And then also have stuff like rate limiting. So you can't submit like over 200 requests at once to try to crash a server because yeah, some of you guys tried doing 
doing that to mess with me. It just reminds me that by leveraging these AI tools and all these LLMs, it makes it so much easier to build apps yourself. But really, it's almost impossible to replace software engineers because there's all of these vulnerabilities and stuff that you never think about that the AI just doesn't address. There's, that's it for me today. I'll go back to you guys tomorrow. Before we get into anything, I wish I knew this earlier. If you're a dev or entrepreneur that's building a mobile app, you absolutely need a website because Google searches will drive so much traffic to your app, which just leads to so many new users. Now, the problem is it's actually pretty time consuming to sit down and make a website that is SEO friendly. And this basically means that Google knows how to index the page and show it to popular searches when people are looking for something similar to your app or website. This is where the sponsor of today's video, Durable, comes in. It builds a full site for you using AI in about 30 seconds. And then it's highly customizable, so you could throw in some of your own images and change some text around to customize it how you want. My favorite part is their AI content strategist. It automatically generates a bunch of blog posts for you to naturally drive traffic to your website. I've been playing around with it a bit this week, and we could already see a traffic search to our site. We're really trying to push for app downloads as the semester starts, so this is super, super cool. Don't be afraid of AI, leverage it. So if you need a site for your own business or your own app, I highly recommend you check out the link in my description and use code ERIC30 for 30% off. All right, we've got a busy week of coding. Let's get into it. I've been at home for a couple days now, so I've been absolutely just locked in on Empor. And in particular, I recently started experimenting with the new AI dev tool, and it's been like absolutely game changing. If you haven't heard of Claude Code already, it lets you use Claude, which in my opinion is the best LLM for programming out there, directly in your terminal. Since I've started using it, I've started feeling like a 10x developer, and I'm not even kidding. I've been able to go through bugs that I've been stuck on for ages and release these new features so, so, so fast. Let me just show you how cool this is. Okay, so right now I'm in my terminal in cursor. I just type Claude and then it opens up Claude code. And now it's just as simple as prompting it. So for example, in the cart.tsx slash ID pages. And now it's using tokens to go ahead and find a solution for me, creates this little to-do list here, and then it's looking through my files to find exactly what I was talking about, reading everything relevant, so I don't even have to give it the context. It goes and does it itself. So now after giving itself the proper context in its context window, it's like I could see that the cart file currently uses React Native standard image components. So we want to check how the other expo image is being used. And now it starts suggesting some updates one by one, line by line. So now it could be like, do you want to make this update? I could also do yes and don't ask again this session, which I don't recommend. Or you could be like, no, and tell Claude what to do differently. In this case, I'm just going to say yes. And that's going to keep going through all of the rest of the files and keep making changes until you're happy with it or it determines that the task is done. Okay, so as you can see, now it's done. It summarized all the changes for me. So let's go ahead and start the Expo server. I'm just scanning this on my phone to get the demo up. And there it is. It's loading. All right, so now we're just going to go into our new little wishlist section here. And look at that. The images just load so much faster and cleaner. For reference, I'm going to show you what the actual Empor app that's live on the App Store looks like. It's so inefficient. First, look at that loading. And we go into the wish list. Watch this. So slow. So slow. And this was causing memory issues on iPhones. This was an important fix. And instead of taking me days through reading a bunch of documentation, it literally just took two prompts and maybe 10 minutes. And this is honestly pretty addictive because instead of wasting time, you could actually build and iterate things. And as someone that got into software engineering because I love building things from scratch myself, this is just game changing. So this is far and away the best AI tool you could use. Just past midnight. I've been so locked in the last few days. I just realized I probably look a little bit crazy. But basically, my team managed to secure a contract to let us sponsor Frosh at McGill in like two weeks' time. And for those that don't know, Frosh stands for Freshman Orientation. And that's an event that has like 10,000 freshman students at McGill. It lasts five days long. We're gonna have our Empor logo on the shirt. And then for the management and arts faculties, we'll get to be present. We're sending two of our representatives. And for between 500 to 600 students, we get to give them some sort of item as well. But basically, this means we need to prepare for a massive influx of users on the app, which is what we want. And let's just say as of right now, the backend servers are absolutely cooked. So I've been going through and implementing a bunch of these best practices to just improve performances as you scale. One of the biggest ones is implementing 
caching. So think about it this way. If you have a hundred people in your app and they want to make a request to your server, if you don't have caching, if it's for the exact same information, they still have to make a hundred requests, which is inefficient, especially if you're returning that same data. But with caching, the way it works is if the first person makes a request, you store that response data in a cache. And the next time someone tries to make a search for that exact same thing, you look in the cache first instead of triggering the server and you see like, oh, this was already searched for and just immediately return. So it doesn't even bother looking through the database and it's a much faster experience and it improves the loads on servers majorly. And really it's just like a crucial thing to implement as you scale. So I've just been cooking that up. Let me show you how cool this is. So this is our current listings endpoint. As you can see right now, I made a search for some mixed listings and specific categories and it took two whole seconds to get the data we're after. So now let's just go ahead and deploy our local changes so I could show you everything. Okay, so we're live now. You can see it's now on local host instead of our live server. Let's go ahead and test this. As you can see, it's already a second, now half a second, 400 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds. So just from a user experience level, we had an improvement of like one and a half seconds per request, which is crazy. Now, an even better improvement that I made was adding this little block of code to pre-warm the cache every eight hours for now. So basically what this does is it skips that initial query that we even need because I don't want one single user to have to deal with any latency issues or be fed up with something taking two seconds to load. It's a bad look. So instead this cron job pings every eight hours to automatically refresh the cache with the new listing. So basically my server is automatically refreshing. Like look, I added some logging so you guys could see. It could be started mixed listing cache refresh at this time, process 300 listings with this algorithm that I built. And yeah, that's about it. One thing I will say as AI starts to take over a little bit, it just feels like the need to understand how system design works and all of these software engineering processes just got even more important. Because if I didn't have a bunch of internship experience where I literally worked with Redis and caching before, I would not have known to do this. So my users would have been impacted by servers would have been flooded and I would have had so many errors as I scaled. And honestly, the startup probably would have collapsed. Even when I was working at Amazon, I kind of had the opinion that software engineering is not about writing code, but it's instead about building maintainable solutions that are cost efficient, error free, and that follow all the best system design practices. So if you're watching this video and you haven't gotten started on system design yet, I highly recommend you start picking it up. All right, I'm just gonna go push that change so it's live. And one more thing before I go to bed. So on GitHub, I have to review some of these other team members' codes. And an AI tool that I absolutely love is this little co-pilot AI because it basically just reads through the pull request, gives you an overview, explains the key changes, and then it goes and gives you suggestions. So that way on my own code, if I miss something, I have an extra pair of eyes to look at it. And when these interns submit code, I know it's at least kind of free of bugs before I have to add my own review. Really cool, huh? And I need some sleep now. Pick it right back up tomorrow. <laughs>it's been a couple days we're back in toronto now and we ended up getting the new version of the app out for release so now as you can see mpor is completely fee free for everyone hopefully this really drives new users to our app as i mentioned we have so many new marketing campaigns like we're going to be at frosh we're thinking of expanding to other schools really really soon there's a lot to get into also look at this this is over the last month we've had 3k impressions and 116 downloads when we had literally zero marketing i think that's really really cool and it's really exciting because i feel like there is such a huge potential here with that. Let me show you what the current version looks like and then everything I did. So if you're a beginner who's trying to build an app, you could try to copy me. Okay, so first of all, in app development, the best way to start is to work backwards from key functionality that your app needs. For example, the app needed to have a login and sign up authentication workflow. I had to build this JWT authentication workflow in my Spring Boot backend, where basically we return these JWT tokens to a user if they're authenticated. Otherwise, they can't access our platform. So that adds a level of security to it. And then when you enter the app, you get taken to this marketplace section. So let's say I wanted to buy this shirt. You could go and look at it directly, open an image and chat with the seller directly. So while building out this functionality, I thought we obviously need a place to store images because users need to have their images live somewhere if they want to sell something. So I put everything stored in Firebase. I also kept this discover tab, which is now hidden in this nav bar, which is like our old Tinder workflow where you could just like items and add it to your cart. 
cart. Also look at that, when you add an item to your cart, we have this little icon, which is a super cool user experience. Now we also have this user profile where you could go and follow people. And to have stuff like that, we obviously had to keep track of every single user's data and information. So I stored everything in a Postgres SQL database on Supabase. And this is because Supabase starts off as something that's free, so it was great for a beginner startup. And with Supabase, they also have this real-time messaging, so my messages get sent immediately on the app. Besides that, we have this new search tab with all of the import MVPs, which are basically the top sellers and trending items, a sell now button so you can add your own listing, and then this community tab, which we're going to touch on in a later video, it's going to be a great expansion point, but basically you just get to talk to people that you follow or your entire community at McGill. In general, from a development perspective, I chose to work with React Native and Expo Go. And this is because once I developed the app, I could distribute it across multiple platforms on iOS and Android with the same code base. So it just makes my life a lot easier. Then from a system design perspective, I followed the coding architecture, model, view, controller. And this is a very common coding architecture where the model is what handles all of the logic and interacts with the database. The view is basically how data is presented and it's what the user sees. And then the controller is what handles all of the request flow and talks with the model. I can talk about that stuff forever. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Anyways, at the time of recording, it's August 14th. McGill starts up again, August 27th. So that leaves us with 13 days or just under two weeks to finish perfecting this app and to start scaling it. There's so much to do. The vlogs are gonna be flowing like crazy. So make sure you leave a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.